I've got a pen too. You guys got a pen, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Thanks. I just leave the ink and eat it. Good morning, guys. That was loud. That was so loud. Good afternoon. I'm Councilmember Joe Borelli, and I'm Chair of the Committee on Fire and Emergency Management. I want to thank the public for attending today's hearing, and I'd like to also acknowledge the committee members who are present. Just Councilmember Haim Deutsch, who, uh, hi, good morning, Haim. Uh, regarding to the subject of today's hearing, the committee will conduct an oversight portion related to the FDNY's ambulance costs. In addition to the oversight portion of the hearing, we'll introduce what we'll hear introduction 1475, which seeks to amend the administrative code of the City of New York in relation to requiring the Department to uh, report on ambulance transportation costs. During today's oversight portion of the hearing, the committee will examine the cost breakdown of EMS ambulance service for our city. Specifically, the committee wants to explore the FDNY's charitable care policy, whereby individuals qualifying under the federal poverty line can apply for relief from financial obligations arising from ambulance transportation in an FDNY EMS vehicle. We'll, we'll take a look at how the department addresses the number of requests received, the reasons for denial, and the rate upon which such applications are granted. Additionally, we look for further examine, We look to further examine the financial burden the emergency medical services place on New Yorkers above the federal poverty line, but for whom medical expense can strain financial stability. In addition to the oversight hearing, we will hear introduction 1457, which I discussed earlier in my remarks. We anticipate the department will provide testimony in this legislation, allowing us to gain a better understanding of their position on the proposed reporting requirements. I would now like to ask those members of the administration who plan on testifying, please state your name for the record and raise your right hand as the committee counsel, I don't know where he is, uh, administers the oath. Oh, oh I'm sorry. <laughs> Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to the council member questions? Thanks. You can begin. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Borelli and all the council members present. My name is Stephen Rush. I'm Assistant Commissioner for Budget and Finance at the New York City Fire Department. I'm joined by Rich Brennan, who is Director of Revenue Management at the New York City Fire Department. Thanks for the opportunity to speak on this legislation. Intro 1475, which was introduced by Councilmember Aldrich and Chair Borelli, would amend the city administrative code of the City of New York to require the fire department to make quarterly reports on the variety of information relating to ambulance transport costs. It would require that such reports include the number of ambulance transports conducted by EMS, the number of times the department has sought reimbursement from a third party entity for an ambulance transport the number of ambulance transports resulting in a patient receiving a bill and the average amount of the bill. The number of applications that the department received for patients seeking relief under the department's charitable care policy and the number of such charitable care policy applications that were granted. For the majority of our transports, where we were able to bill close to 90 percent, the department seeks reimbursement of transport costs, costs from a third party entity such as public and private insurers. This can sometimes be a lengthy process as some patients do not or are not able to provide sufficient insurance information at the time of transport. In these cases, the department follows up with patients and or the destination hospital to obtain the correct information and seek reimbursement from the insurance provider. For some patients, we are unable to identify any type of insurance and therefore the patient is the primary responsible party. Among, among patients for whom insurance is not available, a small number apply for the department's charitable care policy, while others choose to negotiate to settle their bill for a reduced amount in accordance with terms that we have addressed with the New York City Comptroller's Office. The fire department does not object to the reporting required by intro 1475. One comment we do have is on the, the time frame for reporting. I think you're looking for quarterly. We think annually would be a better way of providing information. As I stated earlier in the process, the the, as I stated earlier, the process of collecting can take some time. As a result, bills for transport are generally not re resolved within a quarter. Reporting over a year-long period rather than a single quarter would likely prevent, present a more accurate picture of cost collection activity. It would also provide an expanded universe of data, reducing the, the chances that an anomalous spike in activity skews the data and leads to mistaken conclusions. We're open to discussion about this, and we'd be happy to answer any questions you have at this time. I'd just like to also note that over the years, we have worked with your office on budget pre-hearing testimony, and we've always provided revenue data whenever it was necessary 
that offer is always available to the council. Uh, thank you. We've been joined by Council Member Brannon uh, and Cabrera, who had to leave. Um, can you give us an idea of how many requests for financial relief through charitable care policy the department receives in a calendar year? Very few, Very probably few. less than two, uh, uh, two dozen. So in your estimation, it doesn't affect at, at any rate the, the overall department's budget or, or revenues in any way? Well, obviously, there is a portion of the population um, that does n apparently, from all our efforts, does not have insurance or does not have the means to pay um, in both cases. And, and, and so we do not get responses from those patients despite, despite our best effort, and so we're not able to collect on those patients. Uh, how, how many charitable care requests were denied out of the, out of the two dozen or so? I think there were two that were denied. Two, okay. So it's, it's, it's infrequently that they happen and infrequently that they get denied. That's, that's correct. Um, and just by a comparison, what are the total number of ambulance transports during that same calendar year? So in a year, we do approximately 700,000 transports. Um, does the department use a, ch a charge scale for specific types of ambulance personnel and ambulances? In other words, or is it all one cost? We, we have a one cost negotiated um, that we put out through rulemaking. Uh, last time we raised the rates was approximately 2015. And there's a rate for BLS and there's a rate for ALS. And there is a s Medicare also allows a ALS level two rate that we also apply in rare circumstances. And um, is that determined by the unit that responds or by the level of care required? It's the unit that, in, well, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's twofold. Um, it's obviously if an ALS call goes and it's an ALS type incident, we're going to bill at the ALS level of service. Okay. Are there any instances where an ALS unit responds and they don't need advanced support or just? Uh, that, that may happen, yes. And then we're only allowed to bill at the BLS okay. level of service. Um, what is the total amount or the total number of cases that are in arrear for ambulance services? So there are approximately, of the patients, we're able to obtain demographic data either through our crews getting information or through the hospitals providing us information because we do a lot of follow-up with the hospitals. We're able to, you know, there are about 10% of that population that we're not really able to collect um, of, so of the total of the total 700,000 transports is roughly 10%. Um, how do you how do you collect? I mean, do you, do you use a, a third party collection agency? Yes, we do. Yeah. Okay. And what what is the sort of uh, percentage that that just gets uncollected in, in the total amount? The percentage? Yeah, roughly. It, it's roughly about 10%. Okay. 10% of those we're able to identify bills for. And how does that compare to private uh, hospital providers? Who are providing well, I can only compare with H HHC and HHC. And don't forget, there's a different audience here. Um, we are capturing a patient, so to speak, in an ambulance where the person may not be conscious. The person might be in an altered state. Um, there might be language issues. There are all sorts of barriers, unlike a hospital setting, where someone will come and greet you and collect all your data, demographics, whether you have insurance or not. We don't always have that luxury. You know, our main goal for the EMS is to get them to safely to the hospital. And so whatever information they get is, is good and it's helpful, but not in all cases do we get information. that be, there can be homeless people being treated, uh, transported, you know, prisoners being transported. There's a whole variety of patients that would not qualify. Okay, before I turn it over to questions, I want to acknowledge Council Member Maisel, who's here wearing a lovely red tie. Good morning. Uh, National Red Tie Day. Good, by the way. good. Oh. Uh, and um, I, I just want to state for the record that I know we don't have some operational people here, but uh, at the next hearing, uh, it will know uh, perhaps the next hearing will be the budget hearing. Uh, but at a some hearing uh, in the foreseeable future, we'd like to talk more about the ambulance service uh, and uh, the response at Hudson Yards, which was in Cranes uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, you know, we have some questions. We got some different uh, data from the hospital uh, than that which was provided by the department, uh, and we would hope to make that a, uh, a, a specific point uh, of an upcoming hearing. So, uh, gentlemen, do you have any questions? I'll ask. Thank you, Councilmember Deutsch. 
you twist my arm. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, and first of all, I'm excited to be um, appointed to this committee. Uh, this is my first uh, committee hearing. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to tell you. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> Weighing in at 220. And it's also my birthday. Yeah. Thank you. Happy so don't birthday. forget to file your taxes. Um, so my question is, uh, thank you um, for being here today. Um, so if someone is is not on uh, is not low income and they're above that uh, threshold, the income threshold of receiving uh, Medicaid or any type of insurance, they don't have any insurance. Uh, how many? What happens? What is the procedure if you don't collect um, uh, the cost of the transport? So. We provide different mechanisms for patients who do not appear to have the means to pay, including obviously charitable care, which is rarely used. And there are settlements that are offered where we can reduce the bill to the patient. We also allow for a period of time to pay to pay off the, the debt in installments. Again, for the patients in this group, largely, they, we do not have much success because, you know, despite several bills going out, including a bill from our law firm's outside collection firm, they have a legal collection firm, we do not have a lot of success in that, in that yeah. area. Do you have a number of how many people are in collection? Well, everyone is in collection. When you define, you mean like how are in arrears beyond three years? Uh, beyond the uh, person can pay, so they're in collections. Then what happens? It's so does, does, does it go to the credit bureau? Does no, it report uh, it? no, we will not do so, that. So, so what happens if someone's in collection? What is so, the procedure? And it's three years, four years, five years, and you're still going after him? No, we're, it's, it's, we we send several bills. And I think it's three, and then after the, if those attempts aren't satisfied, we basically write the claim down. So you write the claim down. So why, why is it that you're giving it to a law firm? And you, you have to obviously pay the law firm, right? We've, you know, we've been doing this for quite a long time, and we've done lots of different things. When we first took over H AMS from HAC in 96, we were, uh, we were concerned with the low level of payment. Um, the number of people who do not have insurance who, or the means to pay is obviously a large number. And so we were trying to be selective on going to the courts because you could not, you would overwhelm the civil courts if you had to have hearings on $400 to $800 bills, that's $800 now. So we tried to do that in a limited fashion. Actually, our cost for subpoenas um, and our indirect cost to do that operation cost us more money than we were actually able to collect. We then tried to outsource the debt. We sold the debt to a third-party collector. That worked for a couple of years, and then they said they were no longer interested in this type of collection effort. So we've done different things to try to collect, you know, and we're always looking for new opportunities, but our best issue is really trying to settle the claim for a reduced amount, and that has some limited success. But, you know, overall, we have to write off a lot of claims. So do you have the cost of what it costs the city of New York to pay for the lawyers, which are which um, those um, that it gets forgiven to those people? Do you have a cost of it? Those that's, that, that cost is a contingent-based fee if they collect the money. And that's obviously so what is the cost for the entire city uh, to those that are forgiven and you have to pay a law firm? So if you're, again, looking at 10 percent of the population where we potentially should be able to collect but are not able to because of whether they don't have the means to pay or insurance, You're to and the average collection being probably under $250 on 70,000 transports, you're talking um, a number that's relatively, in the greater scheme of our collections, less than 10 percent. So what would that be? About uh, probably less than $20 million, like $18 million. So it would be $18 million that the city's paying to a law firm. No, we're not paying. No, the law firm's not. This is $18 million that we're writing off. You're writing off. Because in, as bad afford. debt. And after three years, it's forgiven, correct? The, the debt so, is usually written off after two years. After two years. Um, now, how does one get a hold of the department's uh, charitable care policy? You said it's the really policy is on online. So you're saying so? Why is it really used? And 
there's, there's two things. The, the policy is online, and when we send the bill to the patient, it's, it notes, if you, are, if you think you're eligible for charity care, please contact us. We then get information from the patient to see if they qualify. And how, what makes them qualify? What makes them qualify? They have to show some proof of income that is below the standard of the, the federal poverty. You know, it's for up to 400% of the, of the federal poverty level. And who funds the charitable care? There is there is funds. I mean, the fire department is basically taking a reduced payment in these cases. Oh, so it's not funded. So they just take. So they take the reduced payment. Right. But if someone does not go so the, to charitable care, they end up. It's it gets um, written off anyway. Yes, I think the I think you're thinking of the hospitals and in the city and the state. Actually, there is a charitable care pool that they participate in. That's not available to us. Uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, ju just to circle back around on some of the costs, uh, can we go into how the department uh, may reimburse or collect or involve themselves with some of the voluntary ambulance services? We do. We don't have any collection efforts related to the voluntary ambulance services. Are, are they eligible for, for charity care? The, the, what, we don't know what the voluntary hospital's policies may be. They, they probably do, but I can't, I can't attest to that. Okay. Thank you. I think that's no questions. Thank you. Okay. We do have one speaker, uh, Mr. Oren Barzali, from Local 2507. Ah, I just thought of another question. See? Look at that. You left too soon. Get him next time. Yeah. Thank you again. We can shoot them an email after if you want. I'm sorry? We can shoot them an email. Uh, Warren, you may begin whenever you are ready. Good afternoon. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. Last year, the FDNY EMS budget was $321 million. This was offset by $189 million in collections from insurance companies, Medicare and Medicaid. However, additional stress was placed on the budget by paying private companies and voluntary hospitals $12 million a year to contract the ambulances into the 911 system. These entities account for 30% of the current daily tour account, or 160 shifts per day at a rate of $75,000 per unit. These units often operate at a level well below what is expected of FDNY EMS units. These units, like all ambulance services, are permitted to bill for services provided. They are also able to fill empty hospital beds generating additional revenues to these hospitals at their respective institutions. Thus, we pay for inferior service while sacrificing potential revenue. This is conducted under the shadow of a sudden, massive departure of units as witnessed by Transcare. Surprisingly, these units tend to be located in a more well to be, in a, to be located in the more well to do neighborhoods, such as Astoria, Howard Beach, Bayside, and the Upper East Side, where the rate of people with health insurance is much higher than in areas typically covered by FDNY ambulances, such as Bedside, Bed Stuy, East New York, and South Bronx. These results in a higher prorata percentage of payment actually collected. The current situation strikes me as a bit odd. We are in a situation where the department pays a large sum, of, sum in order to forego an increase in their billing capability while accepting substandard unit capability. We, we also further subsidize their participation by providing dispatch data, medical control oversight, and routine daily supervision at no charge. 
it seems that the revenue stream should be revised, if not reversed. The FDNY should assess a charge to each private entity for the dispatch data that earns them the direct as well indirect revenue. The costs associated with medical control and daily supervision should be paid up front. The resulting revenue that would flow to the department could be used to add additional tours to the FDNY ambulance metrics without increasing the budget allocations. Thank you, Warren. I just have a question. You, you, you um, included some data in your uh, remarks on paper. Can you just tell us what it is for the record? Those are the voluntary units location uh, where they're the, uh, the area of coverage. As you can see, some of them are in prime neighborhoods where people have insurance. Do, do you think the department would turn a profit or at least uh, spend less money should the FDNY take over ambulance services uh, in the, say, or wherever the, the 160 shifts per day are? I believe the department will show a positive inflow. Do, do you think the department, why do you think the department is choosing not to operate these potentially, um, these potential shifts that might generate more revenue than those that they already do? Well, uh, they, they get into contract with these entities um, for, for whatever reason that's not being given to us. We have tried in the past to get copies through a formal request as to why these contracts were given and what were the details of those contracts. Can you just explain uh, how and why the FDNY still has to pay a cost for voluntary ambulance services through dispatch? That's a good question. Uh, we've been asking them again for years about uh, generating revenue through dispatch. 10% of, of our service is allocated to dispatch. We have approximately 400 dispatchers and call takers. That's 10% of our service. And, and to your knowledge, the voluntary ambulances do not pay uh, for that service? That's correct. Okay. Any questions? No? Thank you once again. Thank you. Are there any questions from anyone else before we adjourn for the day? No. Thank you all.